church say amen. Now, if you don't feel anything after that, you had a person next to you check your pulse. My brother, thank you for blessing us. Thank you for blessing us. Thank you for blessing us. You may be seated, please. You got to let me pause for a moment because that just needs to... You don't mess with someone that's marinating. You don't mess with someone that's marinating. Your pastor said we're like brothers and I don't know why he would do that to his elder brother. But we will have words after the service that will remain between brothers. New Faith, we are grateful to be here with you and for you and through you and with your pastor. I got so excited I left my glasses over there. Uh, I'll be in bad shape, boy. I am considerably older than your pastor. Considerably older. Matter of fact, he is the age of my youngest brother. And so he can't fit that. So he is... We're closer in unique ways. He told you about my coming in his time of need. This week is the anniversary of the passing of my mother. And so it's been a tough week. She bore five sons. Ultimate pastor's wife. laid her head in my father's lap at 96 years of age and went to sleep. So I rejoice in her living and in her legacy. But if you lost a mother, if you lost a mother, I worship differently now. I grieve differently now. I pray differently now. God knows I live differently now. But in that moment, in that week, I have a lot of close friends and associates. But I have two men in my life who are not biologically related to me, but are spiritually related. One is my older spiritual brother who lives in Cincinnati. And the other is my younger spiritual brother who is your pastor. I only have two men I put in that category. And in that week, we talked every day. And the day of her home going, you know, he's moved. He almost got stealth religion. You don't see him, he just shows up. Willie really pulled a stealth move. I looked up and who was standing there. And we share that kind of bond. He showed up, we spoke, he worshiped, and then he left. Didn't stay for the repast, didn't stay around, just hung around. But sometimes the power of relationship is in presence. And not in words, not in cards, and not in deeds. So understand our relationship. I feel his pain. We can be going through something and the other one will call the other one out the clear blue and just start laughing. Because God lets us know when we need to hear from each other. So I'm grateful for you sharing him with me and the love we have for each other, but don't get it twisted, I will come for you. I will come for you. Because he's that close to me. And he means that much to me. And this is the third Sunday of this month, I'm at my pulpit and that don't happen. But because it was his 21st anniversary, because it was his 25th anniversary. The New Sandal Church is now realizing that I ain't in my pulpit again. But they'll be all right. Because God always got somebody who has a word. Amen? Let us pray. God, thank you. For this man of God that you've placed in this house. For 21 years. He's not only demonstrated their name with new faith 
but he's been faithful. He's been faithful to you and he's been faithful to them. He's been faithful to this community. So God, give us a word today. It will be a blessing to him and his people as they seek to do greater things for your name and your glory. It's your servant's prayer. Amen. All right, it's Rep Sunday, and I'm going to confess this publicly. I'm about to steal this. I'm, I'm about to steal this whole thing about people coming like this because I prefer really to be like this. And so when you see it again, I'm going to give you all credit the first time we do it. Well, see, you know, I was somewhere in Chicago. But this is, it is fabulous because people ought to understand. We love you repping what you rep. But there is no greater representation than the one who represents us. Amen. 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 I got family that belong to all of this stuff, and I'm grateful for that. But I'm also grateful that they belong to the family of God. Because that's the eternal relationship that gets beyond all of this. Amen. All right. I want to talk this morning. I want to talk this morning about when God gets your attention. When God gets your attention. I have lived long enough now and pastored the New Salem Church now 39 years to know that God's got a lot of ways of getting your attention. H have you noticed that sometimes God gets your attention to just a little phrase that somebody says, an offhand remark that does something to you. It's an attention getter. Sometimes God gets your attention through a challenge or a problem. And sometimes God gets your attention through a success. Have you had that happen? Things go great and God does something through that success to help you realize there's something happening in here in your life. God does want to do something great in your life. Let me say that again. God does want to do something great in your life. And the only something that's preventing that greatness from happening in your life is you. God wants to do something great in your life. God has nerve enough to want to use you to make a global difference in the world. But as you hear things about that, as God gets your attention about things like that, my question is, what's your response? How do you respond when God lets you know he wants to do something impossible with you? A, a response is not always what you think our response would be. So this morning, let's take a look at the Bible. People that God used the greatest ways and had all kinds of feelings. You know, we can get in our feelings when God wants to use us. They had to come face to face with those kinds of feelings. In fact, we're going to look at one of the people today, but man by the name of Moses. Now, most of y'all are familiar with Moses. Most of y'all remember Moses. Y'all saw the movie. I've got news for y'all. Charles of Heston wasn't the real Moses, but that's a whole other story. God comes and he says, I want to do something great with your life. His immediate reaction was that the same as a lot of us have. He was, in, he was confused. He didn't know what to say. He had some questions. So this morning, I want to speed you on through the life of Moses. I know a lot of you saw the movie, but let me just bring you up to speed where we are now. Moses, you remember, lived the first 40 years of his life in Pharaoh's palace in Egypt. He was at the top, the center of power. Then in frustration over the fact that the people of Israel were being held captive in that nation, that the people of Israel were being held captive in that nation, that the people of Israel were being held captive in that nation, he couldn't do anything, he couldn't make a change, he eventually murdered an Egyptian out of his frustration, and in fear of what would happen to him, he went out into the desert but a desert called Midian. In this desert, he spent another 40 years. He was a shepherd out in the desert for 40 years. He worked for a guy named Jethro. He eventually married the boss's daughter. He's going to inherit the family business. He's got his life perfect. It's all set up. He can't see his future all laid out for him. Then he runs into a problem. Out there minding his own business, wasn't bothering nobody, tending sheep. He runs into a bush. But it just wasn't any kind of bush. The word says it was a burning bush. 
this bush, this fire. Look at what the Bible says. One day Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, and suddenly the angel of the Lord appeared to him as a blazing fire in a bush. Moses was amazed because the bush was engulfed in fire, but it did not burn up. That moment changed everything. That bush got his attention. It changed everything in his life. Now, let's be honest. We're in the suburbs of Chicago. We, we probably ain't going to trip over no burning bushes up in here. But let me explain to you what a burning bush experience really is. A burning bush is when, in the midst of the routine, this was just a common old bush, there were hundreds like it on the mountain, very routine, routine thing. In the midst of the routine, when you least expect it, it was totally unexpected. Moses had been living there for 40 years. He'd awakened to the same landscape for 14,600 mornings. Now, in the midst of the routine, in the midst of the routine, when you least expect it, you'll be surprised by God's invitation. What made this bush extraordinary was the fire. It was God's presence at the center. His presence changed it. It caused this bush to catch fire. It causes our lives to catch fire. And God for asking us to do something in us because we have his fire inside of us. Look, look what happened when Moses began to approach the bush. It's right there in Exodus 3, verses 4 and 5. When the Lord saw that he had caught Moses' attention, when the Lord saw that he had caught Moses' attention, that's what God wants to do. He wants to catch your attention just long enough for us to be able to hear what he has to say, the strength that he wants to give, the faith that he can bring into our lives. When the Lord saw that he had caught Moses' attention, God called to him from the bush by his name, Moses, Moses, here am I. Moses replied, don't come, he says to Moses, don't come any closer. God told him, take off your sandals for the standing on holy ground. I think that God got nerve enough this morning to want to catch your attention. It's an amazing thing because the first thing that Moses heard was his name. It became very personal very quickly. See, I've discovered, Felder, this is a personal experience. We're very personally seeing God wants to do something in our life and the only God can do in my life. Moses hears this great thing that God wants to do and God, and like most of us, this is why I believe we're related to Moses, when he found out that God wanted to do something great in his life, Moses had some questions. You ever question when God wanted to do something in your life? He wonders, how is this going to work? How is it going to work out? He says the same kind of questions that you might be asking when God says, I want to do something great in you. You might as well be asking, and I want to give you the questions this morning so you know you're on target. So when God wants to do something great in your life, here's the first question he's going to ask. Who am I? Is it in the text? How, do you know who you're talking to? You expect me to do what you've asked me to do? It's right there. Who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Moses asked God, how can you expect me to lead the Israelites out of Egypt? Moses said, look, man, this is all good, but you got the wrong dude. How am I going to do this? I'm too ordinary. I'm not qualified to do this job. And the truth is, if God asks you to do something great and all you're looking at is yourself, you're right. You aren't qualified. You're always going to be too old or too young or too fat or too skinny or too hairy or too bald. You're always going to be too heavy or too light. You're too something to do this great thing. You can always offer God an excuse. I'm too busy. For what? Moses says, I can't do this. Who am I? God's got an answer for him to encourage him in the midst of what he's facing. He was hearing knock. He was hearing God call in his life, but he didn't feel qualified to answer that knock, that call. And Moses faced the feeling and God had an answer for him. Look how God answers when he says, who am I to do this? God answers right in Exodus 3.12. Here's what he says. I will be with you. I'm trying to stay calm here because the amazing thing to me about this is God could have built Moses up. He could have been Moses' hype man. 
Moses, you know who you are. You're the man who grew up in Pharaoh's household. You know who you are. You're the one that understands the ins and outs of government on a personal basis better than anyone else I could call. You know who you are. You're the best man for the job. But instead of saying that because he knows that wouldn't be enough, he knows that building Moses up would not be enough, to build his ego up would not be enough, to be his hype man would not be enough. He simply says to Moses, bunk all of that, I'm going to be with you. And that was enough. He didn't point to Moses' qualifications. He didn't point to Moses' qualifications. He did not read Moses' his resume. He didn't point to his greatness. He pointed to what he could do. And he simply says, you don't have to worry about who you are. Just know I'm going to be with you. And here today, I don't care what you're going through. If God has called you to greatness, all you really need to know is he's going to be with you. Some of you need to hear God saying that this morning. You're going to, through the greatest transition of your life. Everything's changing. It's all up in there. Maybe God brought you here this morning so you can hear him say to you, I will be with you. Some of you are going through your greatest problems of your life. It's never been this tough before. It's never been like this. You're wondering, how are you going to make it through all this hell you've been catching? You're wondering if you have the strength to make it. God brought you here for me to say to you, he will be with you. I know some of you are feeling like God's tapping you on his shoulder. He's saying, I want to do something great in your life, but you're not sure if you can do it. God wants to say to you, I'm going to be with you. Bro, you ain't on your own, sis. I got you. Psalms 91.15 says, when you call on me, hold the person's hand next to you because I don't want them to lose it right here. When you call on me, look into what the psalmist says. When you call on me, I will answer. You missed your shout. I will be with you when you're in trouble. I will save you and I will honor. In the end, it's not your ability that matters. It's your available. It's not what you bring to the table. It's whose table who's calling you to it. Let me tell you why it's more than just a cute phrase. When it comes right down to it, if God asks you to do something and you don't have all it takes to do it, don't you think God is more than able to make up your lack? So whatever you don't have, God brings to the table. Whatever you got lacking, God's got more than enough. That's why the person who isn't very able, but who makes himself available to God, can do great things. Sometimes it ain't the smartest cat in the room. Sometimes it's the person who's most willing to get something done. Sometimes it ain't the person who's running things. It's some people who cleaning up things to get things done. See, I've learned God can make up the lack of whatever my lack is. Wherever there's a gap, God's got me. Do, do you think he could pass it off for 21 years? If he didn't believe in lack and God covering the gap, y'all sitting in something. Every now and then, y'all to just shout because y'all got evidence of God making up lack. You sitting on some seats that don't make me tell you y'all story. I tried to convince him not to do it. Ain't y'all glad he didn't listen to me? Why well, some people have the ability, God, I'm available, not really to do much in their lives. It's nothing worse than seeing somebody with all the ability but never accomplish anything. They always about to do it. They always going to do something. It's your availability that matters. That's what makes the difference because God will be with you. No doubt about it. God is more than able. So somebody this morning is wrestling with a decision that does not make sense. Can I help you with something? God shows up in the impossible. He never comes when it's possible. So if it don't make sense, it's probably God. If you can't afford it, it's probably God. God always calls us beyond our reach. All of us feel inadequate at times. I don't care who you are. When, when you feel inadequate, you got a couple of choices. One of your choices you can make is when you feel inadequate is to be, take the comfort and control place. Some of you are capable of doing far more than you're doing, but you're happy being where you are because you're comfortable and you can control it. My flight leaves today, so I ain't got to... I'll be home by six. But there's another choice. 
And you like this comfort and control because people worshiping you as opposed to who got you there. You really think you're all that in a bag of chips? But do you know last night a whole bunch of folk went to sleep and didn't wake up this morning and their company still going to open up Monday morning? The world goes on without us. As much as New Salem loves me, if something happens to me tonight, somebody going to preach next week. The other choice you can make is to trust God's love. When you choose to trust in God's love, you get the same sense of strength and security, only it's not coming from your little control issue. It's coming from the greatness of God's love. Felder was able to walk with y'all through this thing because more than trusting you, he trusted him. Do you know how hard it is to lead folk through stuff they don't want to come through? Sometimes you, I'm just talking about New Salem now. Sometimes you got to drag folks, you got to pull them, you got to tackle them. It's rough pastoring God's people. And then when you get there, look what we done done. <laughs> Ooh, God forgive me for that one. That was just a prayer. I just said. Who am I? God will be with you. That's where Moses starts. And God says, I'll be with you. But there's a second question. Not only is it, who am I? But here's the second question. It's right in the text. Who are you? Who are you? If you're going to be with me, excuse me for being somewhat doubtful, but how are you going to give me the strength? And God gives him a real, that's what I like about God. Most times God's answer is simpler than our questions. It's a two-word answer. I am. It's right there. It's right there. Verse 13, 14. They will ask, which God are you talking about? What's his name? What should I tell them? God replied, I'm the one who always is. Just tell them, I am has sent me to you. <laughs> yeah, like that's really going to help. Could you at least finish the sentence? Give me something here, God, that's really going to help me. What does this I am mean? That's one of the most powerful and important names of God. But what does it mean? When God was saying to Moses and was, he was asking him to give the people he was able to, to he tells him to tell them that I am the one who can meet their needs. Oh, my God, I'm going to preach this sometime in church one Sunday. Whenever needs arise, I'm the one who meets their needs. How do I know that? Because when you look at the rest of the Old Testament, God uses his name again and again and again. I am, and he uses his name. He keeps making different endings, but it's the same name. Then he had a need for food. He had a need for provision. When that need came up, God says, I am Jehovah Jireh. I am which the one who provides makes what? Provisions. When the need had victory in their lives, in personal lives, and in the life of the nation, God says, I am your victory. God says over and over again, when they needed peace, he simply says, I am Shalom. I am your, whatever your need is, God says, put me there first and I'll meet your need. And this is what I like about God. God, fellow, he don't repeat names. Every time you got a need, God gives you a new name. I can meet your needs based upon whatever it is. In a world where we say, I wish, God says to you and me, I'm the one who can meet your needs. Somebody should have just got a burden lifted right this morning. You've been sitting here worried about how you was going to pay some bill, take care of some child, deal with some. And God says, I've already taken care of that. You just need to trust me because when it's the right time, I will show up and I will bless you. God says, I want to do something great to your life, and, and it's all right for you. See, I'm glad that God allows me to have questions, because i got a whole bunch of questions sometimes. I, 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 oh, I'm the only one? God bless these folks and redeem them, and, and we, they repent now for lying in their spirit. They know that they got as many questions as I got. You, you know what I've learned? I, I, I've learned that every time I got a need, I look back over my life, I look back over 69 years, and every time I've had a need, I can't stay there because I won't get through the rest of this. But I watched God put five kids through school that I couldn't afford. And had nerve enough to have three of them in at the same time. I'm telling you, God will meet some needs. 
He didn't show me the way he was going to meet all the needs. He just said, trust me. And what I've learned to do when I don't have answers, it's time for me to deepen my trust and trust God because here's what I've learned, Felder. If he's done it before, he can do it again, and he can do it again, and he can do it again. I can't get out. Every time I think about doubting him, he reminds me, do you remember what we've come through? But, but, we got to hurry. Moses isn't done. He talks about himself. He talks about God. But you know, but, but Moses, like most of us, he got somebody else that's causing him some challenges. Here's the third question. What about them? I'm going to help you today. You're going to go home better. What about these people of Israel that you want me to talk to? You know they're going to have some questions. Moses protested again, says, look, they won't believe me. They won't do what I tell them. They won't do what I tell them. They won't do what I tell them. They won't believe. They won't do. You've been here 21 years. You almost grown. Matter of fact, you're an adult now. You turned 21 years. Yeah, yeah. They, they. <laughs> you thought it was just you. See, this has been since Moses, man. This ain't nothing new. They'll just say, the Lord never appeared to you. He's almost a God. I, I hate to be difficult here, but I got a bad feeling about this. You want me to go out there, tell them folk what you just told me, and, and God set you free, and they're going to say, how do you know that God told you to be the one to set us free? Anybody ever question your leadership? I'm talking about all the leaders out here. Uh, and, 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 and listen to Moses now and, 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 and you expect me to tell them that I was talking to this bush God I, I don't know about you but I, I really don't think that's going to work he, he, he kind of had a feeling Felder, that, that was, they were going to reject him and, and it really wasn't an invalid feeling because if you read the Bible 40 years earlier when he said I'm going to set you free they rejected him See, part of the reason he left was not only that he was afraid of getting arrested for the murder, but because the people of Israel had rejected him. So he's walking right back into the fear that he has. God will always bring you back to the thing that you left him about. Your point of, your point of departure will always be your point of reentry for him. So what you walked away from, you got to walk back through. I don't know who that was for, but take that one for free. This mess is serious business. It's amazing what they keep us from our, what will they think? They may reject me. They may ignore me. They may ridicule me. They may not accept me. The thoughts of they have kept us from dreams. We have stopped doing what God has asked us to do because we are worried about they and them. You letting folk who don't even believe in God keep you from God filling dreams. When you hear somebody say God wants to do something great in your life, there's a change that he wants to work in your life. The first voice you're going to hear is them. I ain't talking about y'all, but I've got some family. They still don't believe that God called me. Because they remember when. i got some friends who are still amazed the folk will listen to me. You always going to have the thems in your life. Because if them can make you doubt them about you, they will never come to grips about them. Here's God's answer to Moses. They won't listen to me, Moses says. The Lord asked them, Mo, what that you got in your hand? Moses said, well, it's a, it's a shepherd's staff. God's answer is always going to be what's in your hand. Yeah, yeah you ain't got to go get nothing new. Because here's how God deals. God says, Moses, get your eyes off of them and just look at what's in your hand. 
Get your eyes off the unknown and get your eyes on what you know. Get your eyes off of what might happen or what they might say and look at what you do have and what I can do. Look at what's in your hand. God takes familiar things and he's using them to take care of most imagined fears. God will always check your fears by what you are familiar with. Moses has to do something to, to make this whole thing work. God says, Mo, what's that in your hand? Now, Mo, I want you to take it out of your hand and place it in mine. Okay, let, let me cut across the field on this. You just a hand off away from your blessing. Okay, let, let me cut across the field. You see, as long as it stays in your hand, it can't do what it's capable of doing. But when you put it in God's hand, God can do with the familiar, which you and I could never. I've watched God do it. it, it it's right there. See, you, you, you break free when you realize that you can't give God what you don't have. You don't need to worry about giving to God what other people have. All you can do is do you. That's what I love about God. I can't do Felder. I can't do nothing. That brother just got fit. All I can do is what Keith Troy can do. But I've learned when I take what I can do and give it to God, he amazes me and what he gets done with what I can do. Stop wasting your life trying to be like somebody else. My grandmother had a third grade education, great philosopher. Baby, be who you is. Her second great teaching was, ain't no right way to do wrong. Let them few words find your way. God said, throw it on the ground. So Moses throws it on the ground, the staff becomes a snake. Moses was terrified, so he turned around and ran away. Now watch this now. The very thing he had been holding, he becomes terrified of. The Lord told him, take hold of his tail. Moses reaches out and he grabs it. Now, I don't care what y'all said, that's a faith move right there. Because most of us ain't willing to grab stuff that we're afraid of. Most of us ain't willing to grab stuff that we're afraid of. Most of us ain't willing to grab stuff that we're afraid of. And it became a shepherd's staff again. So wait a minute. Felder, what's going on here? What's God doing? He's saying, Moses, take this familiar thing. It's the most familiar thing in your life. It's something you've carried with you every day of your life. Take the most familiar thing in your life, the most ordinary thing in your life, and make it available to me. Oh, God. I ain't got to go to no Macy's sale to get this. Already got it. Watch what I can do with it. It was a snake. Moses picks it up. That staff, that simple staff, Moses is going to hold it over the Red Sea, and it splits the Red Sea. Moses is going to touch the Nile River, and it's going to turn the river into blood. He's going to strike a rock with it, and the water comes out. It's the same staff. God said, this is what I can do if you just give it to me. Here's what I've learned. Something amazing happens when I look what's in our hands and we say, God, it's not mine, it's yours. It takes care of my fear in two ways, Felder. First of all, I realize it's just not mine anymore, but it's also God's. And if they've got a problem with me, they also got a problem with God. So I don't have to fight battles because I belong to him. I can stand still and watch God fight my battles because here's what I've learned. God won't get in the ring as long as I'm in there. But if I get out the ring and I tag team it, he's always going to get in there to fight my battle. The other thing that helped me realize is that God takes ordinary things in your life and he uses them in extraordinary ways. He, he loves to do that. In fact, I believe, Felder, he'd rather do that. If God can take something ordinary and use it in extraordinary ways, guess who gets the credit? Not us. See, as much as this is y'all's church, it belongs to God. Yeah, yeah, it belongs to him. God gets the credit, and that's exactly what he does in Moses' life. He says to Moses, give me the staff and watch what I can do with what you give me if you'll just give it to me. So what you got in your hand that you ain't willing to give to God? What you think is yours? That house, it can burn down. That car, it can get a flat or repossessed. 
that closet, don't let your kids start wearing the same size. <laughs> Stuff come up missing. Don't nobody know where it is till they have it on Facebook. Don't ask me how I know that. But this brings me to the fourth and final question. How about this? Is a thing in his life that he feels like because of this, I can't serve God. God. God, I can't do what you're asking me to do because of this. It's right there in that 10th verse, that fourth chapter. Lord, I'm just not a good speaker. I've never been, and I'm not now, even after you've spoken to me. Now, in case y'all don't see it, you realize that Moses is taking a little jab at God right here. God, you've spoken to me, and I still can't speak better. I still stammer, and I still stutter. I'm still clumsy with my words. And yet, God, you're telling me to take what I stumble with and go speak to Pharaoh on your person. It's, it's at that moment as if God didn't understand what Moses was going through. As if God wasn't aware how embarrassed Moses was that he couldn't talk eloquently. Moses felt handicapped. In Moses' mind, he had a disability. But there are all kinds of handicaps. Some of you feel handicapped by your past. You're not, but you feel that way. Some of you feel handicapped by your education. You're not, but you feel that way. You might feel handicapped by your age or your health or your emotion or your service, or what you've been through. You feel that way. Let me tell you when you're really handicapped. When God says, here's something I want to do in your life, and you and I say, no, can't do it because of that. How about that? That's when we're truly handicapped, when we think what we can't do prevents God from using us. But I like God's answer here. It's in the 11th verse. Mo, who makes mouths? That God being simple again. It's as if I didn't understand that you're clumsy with words. I am the one who made the mouth you speak with. Don't you think if I can make it, I can use it? You, 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 you. He says, I'm in control. I'm aware of your handicap, but I want you to be aware of my strength and my ability. And God's always aware of my handicap. God always knows what I don't have. But God says, will you trust me even though you think you have to have it because I got it? Why does he do this, Felder? Because he wants you and me to be aware of his power. He's aware of our shortcomings. He knows what we don't have. But he also wants you to be aware that he has overcoming strength. I wouldn't need God if I didn't have to overcome stuff. And here's the shout. I'm trying to get done. The takeoff, bro, is that no matter what we're going through, no matter what we're wrestling with, he says, you and I are worth the effort to help us get over what we think we cannot go through. I don't care how dark the days, I don't care how many witnesses, I don't care how bad we may feel. God's on the other side of doubt. And he's on the other side of discouragement. God's on the other side of delusion. God's on the other side of pain, neglect, loneliness. God's on the other side of, is it still worth it? Yeah. 21 years. You've been holding these people's hand. I knew this place before you knew this place. Tyrone Pryor worked for my father. 
I knew about this place. Little did I know what God was going to have in store for you. But look at here, look at here, look at here. Ain't you glad he didn't show you what you was going to have to go through? Because, you know, you and I have known each other before we was all that we supposed to be now. We bros for real. There's some stuff we're going to heaven with that we ain't going to tell the angels about. Don't y'all spend time wondering what it is. But here's the thing, man. I went to New Salem 39 years ago with 66 people, most of whom were old enough to be my grandparents. They had stock in Lady Claro. They didn't have gray hair. They had silver hair. Wasn't 10 kids in the church, and my whole ministry had been youth. In those days, I thought God got back at you. So I thought he was sending me there because some stuff I had done. And I said to God, okay, I don't want to go, but I'll go. But God, I'm only going to go for five years. I signed a rookie contract. I'll go for five years. After the fifth year, I'll put the infrastructure in place. They'll be able to go on. And who's ever supposed to come after me? You need to have them ready by the sixth year. Because, God, I'm not leaving the university because the university takes good care of me. And they pay good money. I was working for 66 folk who look like me. The university take good care of me. The university has 60,000. The university take good care of me. Do you know what God fooled around and did? He took what I told him to the angels. They don't have cable. They have us. And they laughed at me. Because in two and a half years, I resigned from New Salem. I'm sorry, resigned from the university and went to New Salem full time with a wife and a third child who was six months old and a 75% hit in income. I know what God can do. Didn't make sense. Crazy. Insane. Even when I tell it now, it sounds insane. That's my church word. But here's what I learned, Felder. My five has now been God's 39. Them 66, as you well know, it's a whole lot more than that now. Sometimes I miss the 66. So sometimes I miss my everyday folk, my blue collar folk who weren't too important to serve. But Phil, here's what I've learned. It's been heartache, headache, been all of that. But, bro. And it was right. Can't nobody do me like Jesus. And it pays to serve him every single day. I've had missteps. I've had mistakes. But God has still allowed me to every Sunday represent him. In spite of my faults, my flaws, and my failures. It's about my handicaps and my disabilities. And here's the amazing thing, bro. Somebody shows up every Sunday to hear what this disabled, handicapped, five foot seven little Negro has to say. When God gets your attention.